up until this point, and with a few exceptions, we've seen that since the time of Narmer and his successor, Hor Aha, the two lands of Upper and Lower Egypt had, at least in theory, been united under a single ruler. The common belief during this period was that without this single ruler at the helm of a unified Egypt, chaos, discord, drought, famine, and all sorts of evil would pervade the land of the Nile and afflict society with troubles that had no end. Thus, the role of the king was extremely important in ancient Egyptian society, and without him, there could be no stability, peace, and prosperity. Shortly after the death of Pepi II, who is said to have ruled for 96 years, the unthinkable happened. There was no single ruler, but several who initially claimed the mantle of kingship. Egypt became fragmented politically, and, if texts from the subsequent Middle Kingdom period are to be believed, chaos, or isfet, reigned throughout the land. But was this actually the case? The archaeological record from this time period is quite scant, with few inscriptions, contemporary texts, and almost no royal monuments to corroborate these claims. For Egyptologists, this span of time roughly between 2181 to 2040 BC is popularly known as the First Intermediate Period, and for them, it's essentially a Dark Age. By the end of this program, though, hopefully we'll have shed some light onto this mysterious but fascinating time in ancient Egyptian history. Selections from later pharaonic texts, traditional histories, and the works of some classical authors tell us that after the reign of Pepi II of Egypt's sixth dynasty, several independent states formed out of what was once the unified Egyptian kingdom. Minito has essentially divided these up into five separate successive dynasties that are numbered 7 to 11. While the archaeological record does seem to confirm the existence of several new power centers throughout Egypt at the time, it also indicates that, rather than ruling one after the other, there's some overlap between them, and likely none of them had control over the entire country other than in name only. Pepi II's death in 2184 BC resulted in a succession and dynastic crisis of epic proportions. Pepi's son and successor, Merenre II, who was probably an old man by the time his 96-year-old father had died, reigned for a very short time, perhaps only a few months to a couple of years at most. Regardless of his time on the throne, he seems to have had little to no power outside of the capital city of Memphis. Several other weak rulers were said to have succeeded Merenre II, but their relation to him and the royal family of Pepi II are uncertain. What is evident in the archaeological record is that large, state-sponsored projects came to a screeching halt, and royal inscriptions are all but absent. As we saw during Dynasties 5 and 6, the power and influence of the provisional governors, or nomarchs, steadily grew as the government in Memphis became more decentralized. Though in theory, they were all still subservient to the great king in Memphis, each new generation of nomarchs became more independent from the crown than the one before it. After the complete breakdown of the Sixth Dynasty and the confusion that followed, it was perhaps not so much of a stretch for many powerful nomarchs, who themselves were living in large palaces, surrounded by massive estates, and protected by private armies, to believe that maybe now they themselves were kings in their own right, and entitled to rule not just their respective gnomes, but perhaps even the whole country itself. According to Minito's Egyptieca, much of which is lost to us, there was a seventh dynasty that had 70 kings. But today, nearly all Egyptologists believe it to be a total fabrication. Or perhaps, a poetic way of saying that there was instability and chaos. Remember that according to the Egyptian worldview, a single king presiding over a country meant that there was peace, stability, and that the cosmic universal order, or Ma'at, was in balance. 
several kings ruling over Egypt in quick succession was an indication that this order had been broken, and that isfet, or chaos, pervaded throughout the land. There is evidence, though, of an 8th dynasty, which may have included kings from Minito's so-called 7th dynasty. Most Egyptologists now believe that the 8th dynasty consisted of 17 kings who collectively ruled for about 20 years. Though claiming to be descendants of Pepi II and ruling from the capital of Memphis, it's doubtful that their authority stretched far beyond the outskirts of the city. A few texts with royal decrees to launch expeditions for the purpose of quarrying stone have been found, but it seems that the monuments for which they were to be used were never built or immediately scuttled as soon as the next ruler came to power. The only king of the 8th dynasty who reigned for more than a year, specifically two years, one month, and a day, as well as left behind some sort of monument to remember himself by, was Kakare Ibi. He had a small pyramid constructed for himself, but compared to his old kingdom predecessors, it was built of stone and materials of poor quality and not those that would generally be used for a royal pyramid. Kakare Ibi was the exception, though. His three successors left little more than edicts promoting some of their loyalists to lofty positions. After this, the so-called Eighth Dynasty disappears from the annals of history. Outside of Memphis, nomarchs began to further assert their power, with the stronger ones either directly taking over the domains of others, or coercing them to at least recognize them as their new overlord. In Lower Egypt, one such individual emerged around the city of Heracleopolis, and is credited with founding what became Egypt's Ninth Dynasty. His name was Meribre Keti, or simply Keti. Manitho writes that he was more terrible than any previous king, and this probably reflects the fact that he claimed the kingship of Egypt not due to his great personality or noble lineage, but through sheer force and intimidation. For his cruelty, though, the gods apparently cursed him, and it's written that he was driven mad and ultimately eaten by a crocodile. The Ninth Dynasty may have reigned for up to 150 years, but it's unlikely that its kings ruled over the entire country. In fact, there was a time when they didn't even have the full allegiance of the people in their own city of Heracleopolis, since a rival 10th dynasty from the same city sprang up to challenge them for about a decade or so. However, some believe that rather than being a separate dynasty, the kings of the 10th dynasty may have actually been a rival faction of the same family. While it's difficult for us today to know exactly who ruled during this tumultuous period of history, the same may also have been true for those living during the First Intermediate Period. Either that, or these so-called kings just weren't recognized by other nomarchs. For example, at the nearby alabaster mines of Hatnob, nomarchs who sent men to quarry the stone there dated these expeditions to the years of their own tenure, and not to those of any king, which previously had always been the case. Likewise, the tomb autobiographies of many nomarchs don't even mention the name of a king, which was something that, up until then, was unheard of in a country where the king, any king, had to theoretically be recognized at the top of the social hierarchy. Eventually, most nomarchs of Middle and Upper Egypt did pay at least lip service to the kings of the Ninth Dynasty in Heracleopolis. One of these was the ambitious nomarch Anktifi, who governed the third nome in Upper Egypt. Based in Hefat, his jurisdiction also included the old city of Heraklionpolis. Though claiming to be a servant of the king in distant Heracleopolis, Anktifi's tomb autobiography clearly indicates that he was out to increase his own power base in what's today southern Egypt. First, he took over the two gnomes to his south. He then turned his gaze north and attempted to take control of the fourth and fifth gnomes, namely Thebes and Gebtu, respectively. This ended up being a costly mistake. 
Seeing how quickly he'd gobbled up the first two gnomes, the nomarchs and princes of Thebes and Gebtu formed a defensive alliance against Anktifi. At first, Anktifi seems to have made some real progress against them, but within a few years, the tide completely reversed, with Thebes now controlling the gnomes that were briefly under Anktifi's rule. This was only the beginning of a new Theban ascendancy and its rise to national prominence. Eventually becoming Egypt's 11th dynasty, these kings would go on to clash with the rulers of the 9th dynasty at Heracleopolis. We'll get into that, though, a bit later. But enough about politics for now. What was life like for the average person during the First Intermediate Period? Was it as bad as later Middle Kingdom chronicles and texts imply? Again, due to a relative lack of resources, inscriptions, and monuments from this period, it's hard to determine. There do seem to have been natural calamities, such as low flooding of the Nile and severe droughts, that led to massive famines across the country, and these, no doubt, would have further contributed to Egypt's political instability. Other than this, though, life for the ordinary Egyptian may not have changed that much, as members of dynasties based in Memphis, Heracleopolis, and Thebes jockeyed with each other for power and influence. The fate of the average man or woman really depended upon which nomarch they found themselves living under. If the nomarch was negligent of his duties as a ruler, or simply cruel and saw his gnome as a way to personally enrich himself and his family, then life for the people living under him was probably harsh. If the nomarch cared for those under his authority and used whatever revenue generated within his gnome for their benefit, then the people living under him would have benefited more than others in various parts of the country. Though the ambitious nomarch Anktifi portrayed himself as a great warrior, he also claimed to be a man of mercy who looked out for the people not just in the territories that he controlled, but also those outside of his jurisdiction. In one passage from his autobiography, which is inscribed on the walls of his tomb, he tells us, I gave bread to the hungry and clothing to the naked. I anointed those who had no cosmetic oil. I gave sandals to the barefooted. I gave a wife to him who had no wife. I took care of the towns of Hephat and Hormer in every situation of crisis. When the sky was clouded and the earth was parched, and when everyone died of hunger on this sandbank of Apophis. The south came with its people, and the north with its children. They brought their finest oil in exchange for the barley which was given to them. My barley went upstream until it reached lower Nubia, and downstream until it reached the Abidin Nome. All of Upper Egypt was dying of hunger, and people were eating their children, but I did not allow anyone to die of hunger in this gnome. Wars, though, are almost always bad for the general population, and a big one was brewing between the 9th dynasty rulers of Heracleopolis and those of the upstart 11th dynasty based in Thebes. In the end, the house of only one of them would survive to claim sovereignty over all of Egypt and re-establish order, or Ma'at, to the land. We'll find out who the final victor was in the next episode of Ancient Egypt, Dynasty by Dynasty. Stay tuned. Thanks for watching. I sincerely appreciate it. I'd also really like to thank Grand Keck 69 Yap de Graf, Pasta Frola, Michael Lewis, Daniel Allen, Danny Van Eck, Wenex TV, Robert Morgan, Frank, Tim Lane, Sebastian Hurtado Correa, Michael Trudell, John Scarberry, Franz Robbins, Brendan Redman, Faridun Darachanji, Jimmy Darawala, Sher Cam, Farhad Kama, and all of the channel's patrons on Patreon for helping to support this and all future content. Check out the benefits to being a Patreon member, and if you'd like to join, feel free to click the link in the video description. You can also follow History with Sai on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, as well as continue to listen to special audio programs on the History with Sai podcast. Thanks again, and stay safe.